So let me read you a verse from what we're going to get into this morning. And it says this. It says, whoever desires to love life and see good days. If you think about your life, I think everybody here would say, I want to love life and see good days. That's something that all of us want, all of us desire in life. I want to love life and to see good days. Now, we may define that a little bit differently about what that looks like for you. So for you, loving life and, and seeing good days, that may be more along the lines of, like, you know, I would love to go to New York City and see shows and see all the people and people watch and go to really cool coffee shops and explore museums and, like, that would be loving life and seeing good days. But some of you would be like, that's awful. I can't imagine anything worse. Like, I would like to be in a tree stand with, like, Garth Brooks and Johnny Cash and, like, a 40-ounce 40 40 ounce camouflage thermos of coffee. Like, that's, that's living life in good days for you. Everybody kind of looks at it differently. You know, for some of you, loving life and loving good days is about, like, just being with your family. Like, I just love being with our family, and we can hang out and cook meals together and play games and watch videos and all that kind of stuff. And some of you are like, okay, loving life and seeing good days is being as far from my family as possible. It's just a little bit different for each person. Now, I share this because while all of us want to love life and see good days— there's something that gets in the way of that no matter who you are, no matter what's going on in your life. There's something that gets in the way of loving life and seeing good days. And it's simply this. It's difficulties. It's hardships. It's suffering. There are things that happen in life that prevent us from loving life and seeing good days. And so the question that we kind of need to wrestle with is how do we deal with that? You know, and I think one of the things that happens is sometimes we're surprised by it. We're like, okay, I've received Jesus into my life. He says there's going to be a blessing in life, and then trouble comes. But I think that we, we're surprised by it, we're blindsided by it, because we forgot what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is Matthew, or excuse me, John 16, 33. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, you're going to have trouble. So when it comes, don't be blindsided by it. Say, okay, this is a part of of life. And so the book of 1 Peter that we're looking at this morning is a book that's written to people who are having trouble in life. They've been exiled. They've been dispersed all over the known world, living in different places, trying to live out their faith, but separated from the community of faith that they started with. And so they're trying to figure out, well, how do we live life in the midst of the suffering and the difficulties that are going on? And so a lot of this study through First Peter has been looking at different elements of what that looks like. And so this morning, we're going to talk about how do we face hardship? How do we face trials? And somebody um, way more clever and way more creative than me said this. He said that there's, we can learn about the three types of suffering from the three Joes in the Old Testament. And I'm like, the three Joes in the Old Testament? I don't even know three Joes. And then he kind of goes on. And again, I'm giving this other fellow credit for this because I'm not Smart enough to figure this stuff out myself. Uh, but you can look at, there's three different Joes, and they each have a different kind of suffering for a different reason. So you, first of all, you have Jonah, and Jonah suffered for doing what was wrong. He suffered for his disobedience. So God said to him, Jonah, go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach a, a, a message of repentance. And he said, I don't want to go to Nineveh. And he took off the other way for a place called Tarshish. He went the exact opposite way that God said to go. And he suffered for that. He was thrown overboard from a ship. He was swallowed by a great fish. And then he was spit out on the shore. So there's Jonah. He suffered for doing what was wrong, for disobeying God. And then there's Joseph, the typical Joe that we remember from the Old Testament, is Joseph suffered for doing what was right. That Joseph didn't do anything wrong, but yet his brothers were jealous of him, and so they sold him into slavery. And then the slave caravan took him down to Egypt, thousands of miles from his home in Israel. And then he was put in a prison. And then he was supposed to get out of prison because he interpreted a dream correctly. But then they didn't let him out of prison because the guy forgot to tell the king what was going on. And so he spent more time in prison. But Joseph suffered for doing what was right. And then the last Joe is Job, Job, Job suffered 
for no apparent reason as far as in his life. Like he, as he looked at it, he lost a lot. He lost his family. He lost his well-being. He lost his farm. He lost his animals. He lost, you know, his health. He lost all of these things. And he doesn't really, from his perspective, know why. And so sometimes suffering is like that. Sometimes it's for disobedience. Sometimes it's for doing what's right. And sometimes we just don't know. But this morning, what we're going to do as we look at 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to look at suffering for doing what is right. In verse 17, Peter writes this, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now, we need to have a moment just of honesty here. As we read 1 Peter and the suffering that they went through, the suffering that we go through in, in terms of at the hands of other people and for our faith is pales in comparison to what they went through. I mean, they were going through difficult stuff. You know, their lives were literally at stake for proclaiming and professing the gospel. We don't, you know, we may have an awkward look or an uncomfortable moment or somebody says something that makes fun of us, but what we face compared to what they face is it just pales in comparison. But yet we can see what Peter writes to these folks about when they're wronged by people, and we can learn some things as well about us and how do we deal with life when we are wrong. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. One of my earliest memories of suffering uh, or kind of getting the bad end of the stick um, for doing something right or not doing anything wrong I was probably six, seven years old, and my sister had a friend over, and they were baking cookies, and, uh, and there was this big block of chocolate, and I asked my sister, can I have a bite of that chocolate, or can I have part of it, whatever's left over? And she said, no, you can't have it. I'm like, oh, come on, let me have it. She's like, no, you can't have it. And then somehow I got in a chase match with my, my sister and her friend who was over baking. And I'm chasing them around and around and around the house trying to get, and they're handing it off. And they're, she's five years older, so I can't catch her. And they're just being mean to me as a six-year-old. And so um, they chase them. I can't, you know, can't catch them. And I give up. And so I start walking back to my room. And there on the couch, they have left the chocolate bar. I'm like, yes. I got it. They forgot that I was still chasing them. And so I take this block of chocolate, take a big bite out of it, and it's bitter, sugarless chocolate. It is absolutely disgusting. (laughs) And I was like, why are you doing this to me? Like, you know, you could have just said you don't like it. You wouldn't like it because there's no, you know, sweetness to it. But they didn't. They were, that was my experience of suffering. I didn't do anything wrong, but I was suffering. And and that's kind of a, a funny thing from my childhood. But the reality is that you all suffer wrongs at the hands of other people. And it may look different for all of us. You know, maybe somebody has taken your words and they've twisted them to mean something that you didn't mean. Or maybe you've been accused of something that wasn't your fault, that you took the blame for somebody else's mistake. Or maybe somebody has gossiped about you that they told something about you that wasn't true, or they told something about you that was sort of a half-truth mixed with kind of a lie, or or maybe they said something about you that was true, but it wasn't their secret to share. I think all of us have been in that position where we have been wronged by somebody else. Or maybe you've been the object of bias because of your gender, because of your race, because of what somebody thought about you and they stereotyped you and you were the object of bias in whatever situation it is. Or maybe even happens around your home where your husband or your wife blames you for something that wasn't your fault. Or if you're a kid watching, you know, maybe you get blamed for something that your sister did or something that your brother did. And you're like, it wasn't my fault, but your parents don't believe you and and you get wrong. That happens in life. So the question is, How do we respond when these things come up in life? And sometimes they'll be big, huge things, and sometimes they'll be small things. How are we going to respond when we are unfairly wronged? 1 Peter 3 to 8 gives us a framework about how to deal with that. Verse 8, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So here's the first thing, is stick together. Stick together. Now, if you look at all five, of there's five characteristics, unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. 
all of those have to do with one another. All of those have to do with the way that we relate to one another. You say, well, how does that have to do with being wrong? You see, here's what happens. Is for most of us, when we are wronged, our first response, our knee-jerk reaction, the thing that we want to do and often do, is we want to retaliate. If we get wounded, we, gonna, we want to lash back at somebody else. And what this verse is telling us is we need people around us who will love us with a brotherly love, who will love us in unity. We need people who will love us. I love this phrase that says, in a humble mind. That's being humble towards God, but that's also being humble towards the people in our lives who will speak truth to us to help us to respond to wrongs in the proper way. And then verse nine, it says, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. Now, we probably, most of us don't use the word reviling. Uh, another translation says insult. So we'd say, do not repay evil for evil or insult for insult, <clears throat> but on the contrary, be a blessing to others so that you may be a blessing and that you may be blessed. So the second way that we respond when we're wronged is we respond with blessing. Respond with blessing. This series, I don't know if you've noticed the name of the series, but it's called The Counterintuitive Life. And I think of, <clears throat> of all the things that we're going to talk about throughout this series that are counterintuitive, like, that doesn't make sense. This one is probably one of the biggest things because that doesn't make sense. If somebody insults me, it doesn't make sense to respond with a blessing. Somebody does evil to me, it doesn't make sense to respond of being a blessing back to that person. You know, because what we want to do is we want to take the golden rule and just tweak it a little bit. We take Jesus' words, which don't say this, but we think they say this, and say, do unto others as they have done unto you. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, do unto others as they have done unto you. Jesus said, do unto others as you would, as you would do unto others. I batched that up, but you know what I'm saying. But it's this idea, if it's not we do to others the way they treat us, that we treat others in response, regardless, with love and with blessing. I'll give you um, kind of an example of this in my world. So some of you know that I coach college tennis uh, at Division II level, and Division II tennis is a bit odd um, because there are no referees on the court. All the players call their own lines. And so you have to have some amount of integrity to do this, but sometimes players don't always have some amount of integrity to do it. And so, so I hit a ball to your side, to Derek's side, and if the ball is in, he calls it in. If it's out, he calls it out. But if the ball is in, he can still call it out, and it's his call. So if, if he makes a bad call in the world of tennis, it's called a hook. Like, he hooked me because the ball hit the line, but Derek called it out, right? Now, here's what college kids do and how they think this works, I don't understand. So again, I'm playing Derek, I hit the ball in, he says it's out, and I'm like, you hooked me, buddy! And he goes, no, it was really out, it was this far out, and it's crazy. So, so then we're playing, and then what happens again in college tennis is he hits a ball that's on the line, I know it's on the line, but I call it out, and I hook him back is the term for that. I hook him back to get him back, and so I do it, because to show him like, hey, you called the ball bad, so I'm gonna call the bad bad to make up for it, right? And, and somehow in a college kid's mind, they think that that's gonna solve the problem. Like, okay, we're even, we be, both cheat each other one time. It never works that way. The other guy gets mad and then they start calling worse and worse and it, it gets explosive. Now you can kind of look at it and go, well, that's silly. You know, cheating somebody for cheating you, it doesn't work, right? But you know, the same thing, this is what it's saying here is that Peter's saying, when somebody insults you, instead of returning the insult, return it with a blessing because you will be blessed in the process. Your life will be better as a result of it. This is how Jesus put it. He says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. That is counterintuitive, but that is what we are called to as believers and followers of Christ. Then he continues on in verse 10. It says, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue 
from evil. So that's where we start. Whoever loves life and desires to see good days. And here's the um, response to being wronged. It's simply this, is hold my tongue. Hold your tongue, that we hold our tongues. And here he says, keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And if you were here over the summer, we did a series called Stay Positive. We talked actually a lot about the tongue and what we say, and so I'm not going to rehash all that. If you want to listen to it, go find it uh, on the web. Um, But I will say this. I would kind of add to this. Uh, It says, keep his tongue from evil, keep his lips from deceit. And I would also say, and keep your thumbs from evil, because we text stuff that we probably shouldn't text that is evil and insult. And I would say, keep your fingers from texting or from writing evil as you think about what you're gonna post on Facebook in response to what somebody else said. So I would add tongue, lips, thumbs, and fingers. Hold all of them. And then verse 11, it says, let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. So here's the next response when we're wrong, is to pursue peace, to pursue peace. Again, this is counterintuitive. When somebody wrongs us, we want to just run the other way and ignore them and say, I don't want anything to do with them in my life ever again. And there may be times where we do need to have some distance from people. It's just killing your emotional health and that kind of thing. But I think a lot of times we just separate ourselves when what we really should do is what the verse says is to seek peace and pursue it. About a year ago, uh, a guy called me up and he said, hey, can we meet for coffee? And I'm like, sure, but I'll be drinking hot chocolate. He goes, yeah, I know. So we met um, for hot chocolate slash coffee. Um, and he said to me this, he said, um, I just want you to know, there's some things that you said and some things that you did, and he kind of recounted them, that really hurt me, that I was kind of offended by. And we talked through those, and where I felt like, yeah, I did, I did hurt you, I did act improperly. I, you know, we talked through those um, and kind of cleared the air, if you will. And those conversations are never fun to have. I don't think any of us likes to be confronted like that. Um, But it was a difficult conversation. But as I read this passage, I so appreciate that my friend did what this says. It says, let him seek peace and pursue it. That's what he did with me. And I think as a result, he was blessed and I was blessed. Here's the last one, comes from the last three verses we're going to look at. Verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Now, as a pastor, I'm pretty sure that I'm not allowed to have favorite points in my sermon, but if I were allowed to have a favorite point, it would be this one. But I can't have a favorite point because that might offend the other points of my sermon. But I love this thing. Here it is, ready? And it's a bit confusing, so I'm going to explain it for a moment, but it says this. It's act or don't act, and I'll explain that. Act or don't act, knowing the Lord has my back. Act or don't act. We do what we do or we don't, or oftentimes we refrain from an action, but we do it because we know that God has this whole thing in control. And here's why I love this, um, this kind of final point, because it comes from what you just saw above. Now, if you're reading in a paper Bible or depending on the um, e-version Bible you have, you probably notice that verses 10, 11, and 12 are in poetry Form. So it's prose and then it's poetry, which shows it's being quoted from somewhere else. And it's being quoted from Psalm 34. Now, if you were to go back to look at Psalm 34, and I'll kind of do this work for us, but Psalm 34 is written by David. Now, we know David as the, you know, the, the boy that slew Goliath, and then we know David as the king over Israel. But there was this period of time where he, David had been named the king of Israel, but he hadn't yet taken the throne. Saul was still there. And Saul refused to give up the throne, and so David couldn't take it. And Saul was so threatened by David that there were a number of times where he went and he pursued David and tried to kill him. And um, in this Psalms, being uh, what we have here, it says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, 
So that's David writing that. He says, I desire to love life and to see good days. But the problem is that Saul is chasing me and Saul is trying to kill me. And there is one scene where uh, Saul is chasing David. David is hiding. He's placed in a place called En Gedi, filled with all of these caves. And, and Saul and his army are after David and his little band of men. And they're hiding in a cave. And Saul's men are outside, and Saul needs to go to the bathroom. So Saul goes into the cave to relieve himself. And then David sneaks up, and he cuts the corner of his robe off. Saul finishes his business and walks outside. And then David follows him after that, and he says, Look, Saul, I cut the corner of your robe off. I am not trying to kill you. And then Saul goes on his way, and David goes on his way. And some time passes, and some time passes. Saul is still king, but then he begins to chase David again. And so David is on one side of a valley. This is called the, um, the Valley of Ziph. And, uh, and so David's on one side, Saul's on the other side, and Saul and everybody in his army are asleep. And so David and his generals sneak in, and there's a spear. Saul's spear is right next to his head. And his general says, I'll run him through with the spear. You don't even have to kill him. I'll do it. And David says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. He doesn't use these words, but he says, I'm not going to return insult for insult or evil for evil. I can't do it. I won't do it. But instead, they take Saul's spear, and they take his jug, and they go across the valley. The next morning, everybody wakes up. And Saul calls out, or David calls out to Saul, he said, Saul, I was in your camp last night. Where's your spear? Where's your jug? I have it. And again, he proves that he is not going to return evil with evil, that he's not out to kill Saul. He's going to let God take care of Saul. And that's what this is about. It says, it says um, have no fear, nor be troubled. It's like, God has my back. I don't need to worry about taking revenge on my enemies because God has this. He is bigger than me. He is bigger than that person. Now, here's what's interesting. Again, back to Psalm 34. Psalm 34 was written, um, and you can kind of read by the, the subheading, at a time when he was with a guy named Abimelech. And that scene in David's life happens before the scene with the cave and before the scene with the jug and the spear across the valley. And here's why that's important, is before David ever gets into this thing with Saul, he makes a decision that this is how he's going to live. Whoever loves life and, sa and sees good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. Let him keep his lips from deceit. Seek peace and pursue it. You see, he makes a decision before these two episodes that this is how he's going to live his life. And so my challenge for you this morning is the same, is that you would decide this morning, I am going to return blessing for insult. When evil comes to me, when insults come to me, when difficult comes to me, when wrongs come to me from somebody else, instead of returning it with evil or insult or harshness, I'm going to return it with a blessing. Why can we do that? Because we fear the Lord. Because we know that the Lord has this in control. He's the one in charge of payback, not me. And I would challenge you this morning to make that decision, to say, I will trust the Lord to do that. When you're wronged and you're going to be wronged, and I kind of hope you get wronged today so that this is fresh in your mind, you have a choice. Are you going to respond with blessing or are you going to respond in the way that you were wronged and wrong the person back? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this passage. Thank you for the life of David and the psalm that he wrote and that we can learn from it. God, I pray that you would teach us, that you would help us, and that you would give us opportunity to respond to evil and insult and reviling, that we would respond with blessing so that we in our lives might be blessed by you as a result. In Jesus' name, amen.